excuse me as I uh, sweep away the Phillies. The New York Mets find a way to sweep their division rival. They've now won nine of their 12 games against the Phillies. They're terrible. The Mets are going to win the NL East this year with the way they're playing. I am so thrilled to talk about this series. We're going to cover all of it on this edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Now, so much great baseball to talk about this weekend with this Mets team, but let's go through the freshest game, maybe the most thrilling game, or not maybe, Definitely the most thrilling game in this series. The first two games, for the most part, were Mets blowouts. The Phillies made game one a little bit close. Game two, a complete route. But this third game was one where it looked like the Mets were just going to walk away with the easy sweep. And then it seemed like at one point, maybe this Mets team just wasn't destined to sweep any teams this season until we found a new Mets hero. But before we get into that, let's talk about the early parts of this game. Once again, a theme we've seen this season is the Mets get out to early leads. And another theme also, by the way, Zach Wheeler. We've seen this a million times when he was in a Mets uniform. We've seen it even more as a Philly. He'll have a bad first inning and then settle down. He'll get that pitch count under control and somehow he gets you through six innings. That was what happened in this one. In the first, he gives up a leadoff double to Louis Guillaume. My guy, man, I'm telling you, he has been killing it. And I'll talk about him a little bit more in the next segment because I want to go through kind of what the Mets offense has done over the last two weeks and also in this series. But he leads things off for this game on Sunday. Starling Marte gets a base hit. He got runners in the corners, nobody out. Francisco Lindor then hits what could be a double play ball if you had, you know, a competent defensive team. But instead, Reese Hoskins kind of fumbles it in his glove, takes his time throwing it to second, air mails the throw a bit. Yoan Camargo has to come off the bag to get it. I think he kind of gave up on it because if he maybe retreated to the bag, he could have got a force out at second. Maybe he should have thrown it to first to get an out. Instead, he chooses to, to get off the bag, field the throw, fire it home to try to get Louis Guillaume, who didn't go on contact, but then went on the throw to second. Guillaume is safe. The throw is offline. Everyone's safe. Thank you again to the Phillies' horrible defense. Now, from there, Pete Alonso got a single to load the bases again, and the Mets got a couple of runs on force outs, but really, that was the offense for a while. 3 nothing Mets. The, the Phillies got one run off Chris Bassett, but overall, he was really solid. Six strong innings, uh, allowed just two hits, three walks, that one run, seven strikeouts. You thought the Mets were just going to cruise to this game where if the bullpen could hold it, you'd get the sweep. Drew Smith comes on in the seventh, gets two outs. Then he gives up a hit on a comebacker. And I don't want anyone to say that Drew Smith is an idiot because it was a complete reactionary thing. He's not in the moment thinking about how dumb it is to stick his hand up to try to field a ball that came off the bat at 95 miles per hour. It was dumb, but that's a reaction play. And he dislocates his pinky. I think they said he's just day to day. So the Mets dodge a big break on that one. But Drew Smith had to come out of the game. Joel Rodriguez comes in. He gets the last out of that seventh inning. Then he stays on to pitch the eighth inning. In the eighth, he walks a pair. He gets two out. And then Adam Adovino comes on to face Nick Castellanos. And an interesting stat I saw on the ESPN broadcast after he gave up a home run to Nick Castellanos is that up to this point in his career, Adam Adovino had never given up a home run when he got ahead 0-2. Well, Nick Castellanos seems to hit home runs in spots like that, and he does, delivering a three-run shot. Suddenly, the Phillies have a 4-3 to three lead. Now, Steven Nogasek quietly pitched a scoreless ninth, so shout out to him. Then you get Nick Plummer up to lead off the ninth inning. And Nick Plummer was called up because Travis Jankowski hit the I.L. with a broken uh, bone in his hand, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's going to be out for six to eight weeks. 
Now, that could be the last we see of Jankowski because you have Jake Mangum in AAA who serves a very similar function uh, as far as their roles as players. Mangum, a great defensive outfielder, a speedster. He can do what Jankowski does, but has a little bit uh, you know, more pop in his bat. I think a little bit of a better hitter. I thought they were going to call Mangum. He just got called up to AAA, but I thought he could fill that same role that Jankowski could. That's the only reason why I thought Mangum maybe should be the call instead of Plummer. Not that I didn't think Plummer should get called up. I've been campaigning for Plummer to get a call up a week prior for Dominic Smith because I think Dom Smith is struggling and Plummer has the pop to maybe give the Mets a legitimate DH who can do something for this team when they haven't gotten anything from that position this year. So personally right now, I like to see Mangum and Nick Plummer on this team, but Plummer is going to have some staying power if he continues to come through in spots like this because he leads off the inning with a moonshot of a home run. It was a home run that would have hooked foul if he didn't hit it so damn hard into the upper tank, 112.8 miles per hour off the bat. And I, I love that baseball savant has the expected batting average when you go through and you look up, you know, each individual outcome. And, and so you'll see, oh, you know, that line drive that went into the, the shortstop Smith that had an expecting batting average of 660, things like that. Obviously, home runs for the most part are going to have an expected batting average of a thousand, but some of them, depending on the ballpark and things like that, you know, if you hit a little, you know, wall scraper uh, when you're at Yankee Stadium. You might find a home run that had an expecting batting average of like 250 because it's a routine fly ball in 28 other ballparks. That home run had an expecting batting average of 1,000 because it was roped. And that really was the big moment for the Mets. I mean, granted, Eduardo Escobar comes through with the walk-off hit, but you're not there if not for Nick Plummer in that spot. Edwin Diaz did a great job holding the lead in the 10th, stranding that ghost runner. And then you get to the bottom half and Eduardo Escobar, who has been swinging a hotter bat as of late. I know it doesn't feel like it, but we're going to go through the numbers in a minute over the last 15 days. And he has been hitting a lot better. He gets the clutch knock, drives in the winning run. Great for him. I think he really needed that. And the Mets are able to complete the series sweep. With that, they are now uh, 32 and 17, 10 and a half games ahead of the Phillies. To me, they just eliminated the Phillies from contention tonight when it comes to this division. I don't think that this Phillies team is coming back from this. They're 21 and 27. Uh, They're way out of it at this point. They just look like a team that's lost. Could they get back into a wild card mix with the expanded field? Yes. But you're looking now at four series victories from the Mets. They don't play this team again until August. And I'm sure Philly is thrilled about that. They've won nine of the first 12 meetings these teams have had. I just cannot see the Phillies getting back into this mix. The Braves, that's a different story. But the Phillies... That's a bad baseball team, bad defensively. And and what you're seeing with with this Mets team this year is by running the base as well, putting the ball in play, playing good defense, you just give yourself a chance. And sometimes you give the opposition a chance to lose a game and and, and for you to to steal one. And the Mets have been able to do that throughout the season. Tonight, Nick Plummer's the hero, um, but just an unbelievable weekend for the Mets. Now they want to try to carry that momentum over as they'll play the Nationals at home before a really tough West Coast trip. So the Mets have to keep the bats hot, and I think that they absolutely can against a dreadful pitching staff in Washington. I want to talk about the first two games of this series a little bit and what the Mets have done offensively over the last couple weeks. So we will get to that in just a minute. But our next partner has a product that I literally use every day, which is Athletic Greens, because for a while I have been trying to figure out how I could get some more vitamins and nutrients into my diet and really wasn't sure where to go. And then luckily... I found out about Athletic Greens, where with one delicious scoop in the morning and a glass of cold water, I can absorb 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that help start my day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your recovery, your focus, and aging. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews, and it's recommended by professional athletes. It costs less than $3 a day, which makes it cheaper than your cold brew habit. It's the single best thing you can do for your body in under 60 seconds. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. In game one of the Mets series against the Phillies on Friday night, they scored the first seven runs of the game. 
And that really tells the whole story. Carlos Carrasco had a little bit of a mixed start. He ends up having five runs earned. Uh, two of them came after he left when Chase Nashreef gave up a three-run homer. Uh, so his start maybe looks a little bit worse on paper than it was when you actually watched it. He was pitching with the lead, um, you know, pitching to contact and things like that. I, I wouldn't worry too much about Carrasco, but the Mets offense was just great again. Uh, you know, Pete Alonso goes two for two in that game with a walk, a sack fly, a home run, four RBIs. They had a stat that came out before the game today that Pete Alonso has 29 RBIs in the month of May. The most in franchise history is 34 by Gary Carter. So he has a chance here uh, to actually break that record if he has a couple of big games to lead off this series against the Nationals. Uh, just an absolute great series and a great month for Pete. This series, Pete was four for seven with five uh, RBIs. They started just intentionally walking him, walked him twice in this game on Sunday, three intentional walks on the series, five walks altogether. They just don't want to come towards him right now because he's swinging that hot of a bat. Um, you know, the Mets did have one bad inning, as I started alluded to there in that game one where they gave up six runs, but it didn't matter. They're able to hold on to get the victory. Game two, Mets were trailing 2-1 in the bottom of the fourth. Who comes up to the plate? None other than Jeff McNeil, who hits a three-run tank, does his little dance in the rain from wedding crashers. Mets take a lead. Francisco Lindor adds to it a couple of times. First, he drives in two with an RBI triple where he got third base thanks to some terrible defense by the Phillies. You will not see a worse relay throw. If you haven't watched that highlight, I encourage you to. Uh, it's pretty bad. Lindor then scored a sacrifice fly from Pete Alonso. He then drove in another run Lindor did in the seventh. Over the last 14 games, Francisco Lindor hitting 308, 422 on base, 596 slugging, three home runs, two doubles, two triples, 17 RBIs. 19 runs scored. He's had two hot streaks this season that have really carried his numbers. But here's the thing that I got to say about Francisco Lindor and whatever haters are still out there when it comes to this guy. There's two players that have been in every single game this year for the Mets, Pete Alonso and Francisco Lindor. These guys are driving a lot of the Mets' success. Lindor's numbers right now stack up as a top three shortstop in baseball. Uh, you know, one of the best shortstop, if not the best shortstop in the National League in a lot of different categories. He's putting up career best numbers in certain categories like WRC plus walk rate on base percentage, things of that nature. He's been great. And defensively, he's gotten so much better, got off to a rough start. We know how bad he was throwing the ball, but he's corrected that. He's got his legs into his throws more. So now he's got the strong arm to first again. This guy's a great baseball player. He's going to be an all-star. I would not be surprised at all if he was the starting shortstop and Pete Alonso was the starting first baseman. They're one of the best teams in the National League. They're the two guys, again, out there every day. I would imagine that they are going to be rewarded when it comes to voting. So let's hold off on the criticism at this point. With the way he's playing, he really deserves uh, you know, uh, nothing but praise at this point of the season. Now looking at the last 15 days for a lot of Mets here. P Pete Alonso, we'll go to him next. 14 games, 17 for 53, 321 average, 381 on base, 585 slugging, 966 OPS. He's drawn only six walks, surprisingly. A lot of them coming in that series, obviously. But he has 17 RBIs, uh, eight runs scored. You go to Mark Canna, he's been solid, 250, 340 on base, um, you know, 726 OPS. He's just been a, a key cog, but not doing too much. Jeff McNeil, though, 333 average, 370 on base, 549 slugging. 919 OPS, two home runs in the last 15 days, five doubles for Jeff McNeil, 13 RBIs, hitting the middle lineup a little bit more behind Pete Alonso. Um, I like to see them go back to that. Obviously, he was out of the game tonight, but Eduardo Escobar is someone that I think teams are going to feel a little more comfortable pitching around Pete Alonso to get to. So I liked McNeil as that you know insurance there for, for Pete to, to maybe get pitched to a little bit. Um, you go through some of the other guys, though. You've got Eduardo Escobar, 280 over his last 13 games, played in 50 at-bats. So he's coming around. He has struck out 15 times, so that's a lot of strikeouts. He's not quite all the way there, but he's getting better, and he had the huge hit tonight. Starling Marte, over his last nine games, played 310 average, 326 on base, 476 slugging, 802 OPS. And then you have my guy, Louis Guillorme. Over his last 11 games played and 29 at-bats, he's 15 for 29. He scored seven runs, two doubles, three walks, three strikeouts. Uh, he's hitting 517, 563 on base, 586 slugging. 
If you expand that out to the last 30 days, he's hitting 408, 473 on base, 531 slugging. Play Louis Guillaume every single day. Bottom line, he should be your starting third baseman right now, in my opinion. Um, and again, they mix up guys so much that it's not that you know set in stone. Escobar's going to get his time there as well. You could put McNeil out and left as Nimmo still day to day right now. I'm not sure if he's going to be back in this upcoming series against Washington. But the bottom line is get this guy as many at bats as possible right now while he's red hot. I love what I'm seeing out of him. You're seeing him play great defense at second, at third, wherever they put him. Uh, he's just making the Mets a better ball club. And really, I, I think when you have Brandon Nimmo, Guillaume, and Jeff McNeil in the same lineup, it's just making life really hard on starting pitchers because these are guys that can waste a ton of pitches. They just get deep into counts, and then they could have that at bat, like one of the ones late in the game tonight where I don't even think it really resulted in anything, if I'm not mistaken. It's just going off memory. But Guillaume against Brad Hand you know, works an eight-pitch at bat and then dumps one into to right field and gets a base hit. You know, did it ultimately result in a run? No, but it, it's still just those types of at-bats that wear on another team. So I, I love what I've seen out of him. I, I love what I've seen from the Mets lineup. Right now, they're doing exactly what they have to, which is win by your bats while the pitching is out right now. We have some good news across the board when it comes to the starters in that Tyler and McGill is throwing a bullpen. Jacob DeGrom says he feels completely normal. I expect both of them to return potentially in June, more likely McGill than DeGrom because they could still play this a little bit cautious. But at this point, both of them before the all-star break seems like a probability, um, which is great. So get through this, this stretch here. You got three against Washington. We're going to talk about in a minute. You got the West coast trip. You, you make it through all of that and you're still, you know, eight to 10 games ahead of the rest of the division. And this team could just get better and better and better as the season goes on when you get healthier. And also when you could see more promotions where guys like Nick Plummer, we just saw tonight and others like Mark Vientos could maybe help this team even further. Yeah. The Mets are in great shape right now. So just an awesome series um, where they were able to really, I think put, put the Phillies at a point where they're, you know, maybe going to fire Joe Girardi. And there's questions about, really everything they got going on right now. And the Mets have been a huge part in putting them in such a bad position. Let's see if they can continue to feast on the, the NL East with the Washington Nationals coming to town. We'll talk about that series in just a minute. But first, a word from our sponsors. Now, the Washington Nationals have not been a good team this year. They're 18-31. and 31. They're 14 games back of the Mets. They are 9-13 and 13 away from D.C., 9-18 and 18 at home. So, Maybe they enjoy playing outside of their home ballpark. They're five and five in their last 10, but this is a team that Mets are head and shoulders better than you got Eric Fetty going in game one. Fetty's been pretty good this year. A 3.55 ERA did a great job against the Dodgers his last time out. So that's really the toughest pitcher you're going to face. But if you're telling me that Eric Fetty is as hard as it gets for the Mets, I feel pretty good about their chances. Uh, Fetty is a right-handed pitcher that doesn't have overpowering stuff. The Mets have done a great job against righties this year, and they got David Peterson on the mound. I think David Peterson has proven to be a really quality starting pitcher for the Mets this year, so I think you're pretty confident when he's on the hill, a 2.16 ERA at this point in the season. Game two, Patrick Corbin versus Trevor Williams. This is an interesting matchup on both fronts. Trevor Williams now ingrained in the rotation. I'm very happy the Mets have gone that route. And the bullpen is getting a little bit thin. You need to see some other guys start to step up. Colin Holderman, that's done a great job. Maybe we'll touch on him after we get through the pitching matchups here. He has been really solid out of the pen. But now with that Williams, that bullpen just gets a little bit tighter. But the Mets need him in the rotation right now. I think he certainly is capable of going out and giving you four strong innings at the start of a game, maybe even five because the pitch count down. And then you got to trust the, the bullpen to hold it. The Mets should theoretically be able to feast on a Patrick Corbin who has a 6-3-0 ERA and has not been good this year. But Corbin, uh, you know, is a left-handed pitcher. And that has been the Achilles heel for the New York Mets. So that's going to be a game that I'm really curious about. So far this season, you look at what Corbin has done against the Mets. First time out, uh, four innings pitch, five hits, two runs. Um, so not an awful start. That was opening day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then you have, uh, the next time out, May 10th, five innings, three hits, four walks, five strikeouts, no runs. 
His last time out, uh, his last three starts since then, he's given up five runs to the Astros, five runs to the Brewers, three runs to the Rockies. So, I mean, Patrick Corbin doesn't fool anybody except for the Mets, I guess. So we'll see if they can uh, maybe break some of that uh, when it comes to that game. And then the last game of the series, we don't know who's going for the Nationals just yet, but Carlos Carrasco will be on the hill for the Mets. So if that is a rubber match game, you feel pretty confident with him taking the ball. Now let's just look really quick at some of the bullpen stats. Uh, who is left in this pen that can help him right now? Colin Holderman was the guy that I wanted to talk about. Eight innings pitched so far this year, 10 strikeouts to just one walk, a uh, whip of 0.75. He's going to earn some trust. He really is. The way he's pitching and the fact that this bullpen's a little bit depleted, uh, you know, he, he's someone that I think could get some run here. You look at some of the other guys, you know, Drew Smith potentially day to day that hurts the Mets. You look at the last 15 days, uh, you know, Edwin Diaz, his numbers haven't been great. 4.76 ERA had a couple rough outings. Um, Seth Lugo has been good. 2.84 ERA. Uh, Joely Rodriguez tonight ends up giving up those runs uh, because Adam Adovino ends up giving up that homer. So the inherited runner score and suddenly his ERA has taken a pretty bad hit. He went from, let's see, going into the game. He had started to cut that ERA down. It was at 3.68 and he basically added a run to it. It's now at 4.6. So I think he's still throwing the ball well enough that I trust Joely. I trust Seth Lugo. I trust Edwin Diaz. If Drew Smith is available, I think he's a guy you trust right now. And outside of that, um, it's pretty much Holderman. And I don't know who else. Adam Adovino has been pretty decent. Like you look at the surface numbers and they've been good this year, but he's given up just a ton of inherited runners where his ERA looks a lot better than it should. So I just don't necessarily know if he's a guy in the late innings you trust. And that's a problem right now when you're talking about this Mets team, when you don't entirely know what you're going to get out of your rotation. And that's why there's so much pressure on the bats right now. But again, thinking about this series in particular against the Nationals, the bats should have no problem. You're going to be facing bad starting pitching, bad relievers. The Mets should be able to score six, seven runs every single game in this series if the lineup continues to produce the way it has. And the Mets need to pile up wins. I said on Friday's show, get four wins out of the next six before you hit the West Coast. They got three of them, and I think now the math changed. Get five wins. Win this series against Washington. Uh, put yourself in prime position, and then if you can play 500 ball out west going against the Dodgers, the Padres, and the Angels, you'll come home very, very happy. Anyway, that's going to be all for this edition of Locked on Mets. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On MLB, hosted by Paul Francis Sullivan, but we call him Sully. Locked On MLB is where you want to go to stay up to date with everything going on in Major League Baseball. You can follow Locked On MLB wherever you get podcasts.